to today's show and we are live and a good morning to you and good morning to everybody who's joining us today vernon how are you doing my brother fantastic we're doing great never better how are you today good good and it is a good morning for all those who are joining us in behind the markets it is the friday edition futuristic friday uh getting ready to catch up on a bit getting ready to wind down um but it is time to get uh, it is time to get going and to get moving right so in today's story we're going to be talking about a few deep dives there are a few actually big stories in the deep diving section uh we are actually going to be talking about building your future uh that is um that is the main conversation building your future and building the future that you want the plan you want and also what it's going to cost you because most people like to talk about the future they want they say i want to be financially free but do we know the cost of making sure that you are financially free and a lot of people have got aspirations i get asked that question a lot so for those of you who come to me with fire aspirations uh, today we're going to talk about actually making it in, uh, about actually making those fire aspirations occur. Uh, what is the cost of those? What does it mean to be saving and investing uh, for? Let's say you want to retire in five to ten years uh, because maybe you don't like your job and you want that financial freedom which you've heard about so elusively on social media and on YouTube. Uh, so let's actually have that conversation out. However. Let's get down to the beginning of the day, Vernon, uh, when we talk about the market indicators. Now, today is Futuristic Friday, 2nd of June, and let's go into it. On the 1st of June, yesterday, when we closed out, the, the, the FX market closed at 19.6096, up 1.64%, 9.69% on the week, uh, up 1.64% on the week, sorry, 9.69% on the month, and up 0.35% yesterday. So the dollar has continued its 29-day uh, rally. So once again, we've gone from a very strong dollar rally a few days off and back to another build up to a strong dollar rally. We've seen gold uh, continue. We've seen that. Sorry, we've seen gold death cross for uh, the the U.S. dollar moving up to in bull in bull status. MACD is actually showing that it's in it's in a strong positive direction, while the RSI is showing it's slightly overbought. So you have to be very cautious. As to getting into dollars now, uh, Zambian equities are up 8,000. Uh, they're still at 8,234. 8, That's where the index is lying. Down 0.94%. There was a little bit of a standard charted sell-off yesterday. Uh, up 1.03% on the on the year, on the month, and up 12.22% year to date. While we're also looking at the bond market, which is up 0.06%. Uh, bond index was down 0.03, 0 0.36%, while well, up in terms of the uh, composite bond yield, it was up 0.09% yesterday. So we did actually have a bond sell-off uh, yesterday as we're actually getting into the market. Now, uh, getting into the rest of the data, we are actually seeing, as we said, there's, there's still a slight deceleration uh, uh, on that. And you are seeing, but you are still seeing that there's upward pressure on the uh, on the USD Zambian Quacha exchange rate, uh, Rand dollar exchange, Rand Quacha exchange rate was up 0.59 percent, getting back to that one number. On the week, it's uh, on the month, it's up 1.73 percent. That slight inflationary pressure that is likely to pick up, but still down 6.89 percent year to date, and still 40 percent off its all time highs. While the dollar is only 13 percent off its all time highs, so you still are seeing. That FX FX risk is one of the highest risks that we're facing for um, that we're facing towards inflation. Remember, the two indicators that we keep an eye on the most are inflation and growth. And right now, the FX indicators are speaking to slower growth and higher infl or at least not really higher inflation, but sticky inflation at an elevated level. That's a very big difference to rising inflation. Okay, now remember, I always I want to just quickly make that point to people. Inflation is not the cost of things. It's the speed at which the costs change. Okay, because everybody seems to confuse this a lot. Because I always hear, I always get that statement every time, Vernon. Uh, no, but uh, you guys are saying inflation's coming down or inflation has, has come down. But the price of things, because that's not inflation. Inflation is the speedometer. Okay, so you have to think about this very carefully. A person moving at 20 kilometers per hour is still moving forward because they're, because they're actually still moving. So in the inflation rate is the speed at which prices change in a given period of time. 
okay? Just something to always remember so that we can always get the, the politics out of it. Unfortunately, this country is tainted with politics when trying to talk about basic uh, numbers and economics. Uh, we also did see that the bond market uh, went up 0.06% while we saw a 0.36% decline, mainly due to the FX rate. Unfortunately, in US dollars, unfortunately, we did see a little bit of a bond sell-off, which has pushed interest rates up 0.091% uh, yesterday. Your so interest rates up 0.49%. They're still not on the highs of 24.81, but they are getting out of that uh, 23 range, and now they're getting up into the 24s again, showing a little bit of negative sentiment hold, holding on to the bond, holding on to bonds in the secondary market. Now, in the rest of it, we're seeing on our on our commodities board. Uh, we are seeing that copper was up slightly 0.97%, while oil continued to hover steadily. Oil stayed steady as they're kind of waiting to see how this debt deal is going to work out. Remember that the U.S. are trying to push this through the Senate. Okay, so that's the where we're kind of sitting right now. We're steady with oil. So already that's giving us signals that whichever direction oil moves in is going to be quite determinant because right now the FX rate is probably going to continue the same direction. Okay, the forex rate is probably going to continue in the same direction it's been moving for the last 30 days. Therefore, that means that we're probably expecting, and if we go back here, we're probably expecting another, so we're probably expecting another six, seven percent movement in the FX rate if we continue down this route. And then again, that kind of fights off against the, the, the oil rate. So we might see that the pump price may, may stay flat if we don't have any, um, if we don't have any turnaround in our in our in our in our fx rate that is pretty much contingent on uh on the deal in our debt uh we're also looking at gold gold is gold has started to move back upwards a bit as we're going into uncertainty remember that america is scheduled to run out of money by monday you never thought you'd hear those words the mighty country america is scheduled to run out of money by monday this is why they're rushing for the Senate to try and get a debt deal through for the debt ceiling. Remember that the House of Representatives managed to get it through by quite a large majority, mainly Democrat-led, actually. Funny enough, a Republican House, that was mainly a Democrat-led uh, vote. And one of the things it did is it took money away from people like the IRS, for example. It kicked the can down a few times and there's some spending cuts that are promised in the future. Now, we're also looking at uh, our, our, our wealth insurance assets. We did see that Bitcoin was down 0.3% yesterday, uh, even though there was a currency push upwards. Bitcoin did move down into the negative by 0.3%. Ethereum up 0.1%, uh, while we're seeing that gold was up 0.57%. This is all in Quacha. People always pay attention. These assets are highly volatile, so you should always keep in your mind that. Now, if you're looking at the broad markets altogether year to date, uh, sorry, you got the wrong date there, but year to date, we are seeing 11.4% uh, upwards on bonds. We are seeing 12.2% upwards on stocks, 8.4% upwards on USD, 18% uh, upwards on gold, 75% uh, on Bitcoin and 68%. Now, remember, the performance on Bitcoin and Ethereum is mainly due to the first quarter. Since then, they've pretty much had a bad run. OK, they've really been having a tough run of it. And as you can see, if you look at the month returns, they're not as high. OK, uh, yes, they are about four percent. Now, that just means these are very, very, very volatile assets. I must stress this point. These are very volatile assets. OK, they switch very quickly. Uh, now, in terms of our four horsemen outlook, uh, but in what we did see yesterday, we saw EU inflation decline uh, to a 16 month low of six point two percent. As core inflation dropped for the second month in a row, we saw our, our South African PMIs up, but still contract in, in contractionary territory, meaning South African products. There is, a, there is an improving outlook for South African manufacturing, meaning the products that we get from South Africa might be a little bit cheaper. U.S. crude inventories were up to 4 million barrels, so that should push oil, that should suppress oil prices, while Korean inflation is slightly up to 0.3% on a monthly level. Japanese capital expenditure up 11% plus up 3.3%, plus while Japanese 10-year bonds up 0.1%. Non-farm uh, non ADP uh, employment numbers are up 2,249,000, 2, but lower than the last month. So in other words, America is still producing jobs. Now we're waiting for the non-farm payrolls data in America, plus the unemployment figures, to see if there's strong growth, then that means the Federal Reserve is not as unlikely to pause. Remember that the, everybody's expecting the Federal Reserve to pause interest rate hikes this month. But if, they, if we're seeing still strong labor market data, that might go against the Fed pause in June. 
Uh, German retail sales are still in contraction, while Korean GDP dropped to a two-year low of 0.9%. It's not good. Remember, this is the electronics manufacturer in Korea. Uh, that you always have to pay attention to. And if you're looking at even Korean inflation up as well, the Korean and Japan and Chinese May PMI numbers were up, were up, were up uh, 0 0.3, 1.1, 1 .1, and 1.4. These were good surprise data figures. While Indian S&P Global um, manufacturing numbers also up 1.5. U.S., German, Italian, and Spanish and EU manufacturing PMI is in contraction, while British mortgage data is in the negative. So we are still seeing mixed data. Uh, coming out here. There's no one direction everything is going. We have weak and fragile growth with spots where it's improving, but we have inflation coming down and interest rates still elevated because inflation is still high, but it's, it is starting to come down. That's the main thing that everyone is paying attention to. So Venom, before we go into our break, let's kick into our first deep dive. And our first deep dive, once again, another country, or as DJ Khaled would say, and another one. Angola has decided to reduce its fuel subsidies uh, days after Nigeria removed theirs altogether. So another one, and this is what we kept on saying, people, this fuel subsidy thing, everyone kept saying, but Angola's got theirs, Nigeria's got... Well, you're starting to see that these countries are also struggling to maintain these fuel subsidies. The subsidy re reduction led to, will lead to, uh, sorry, will lead to gasoline prices rising from 300 Kwanzaa, which is uh, 51 uh, cents, per liter from 100, sorry, to 300 Kwanzaa, from 160 Kwanzaa. Now, this is still less than the open market price of 533 Kwanzaa. Remember, that's what the Angolan government is basically subsidizing at 233. Now, they were subsidizing about three quarters of the price, and it was costing them billions, Vernon, billions. Okay, last year, they were actually dealing with 1.9 trillion Kwanzaa worth of, uh, worth of expenditure that they had to end up doing. That was billions of dollars that was affecting their GDP. Now, Fitch has said that planned gradual removal of subsidies. So Angola is not just once off removing it. They're gradually removing the subsidies. Now, uh, Fitch ratings did say that the gradual removal of subsidies will likely trigger protests and has identified that as the main political risk to Angola. So they are putting that investment in Angola is tainted by that one political risk of Njala probably kicking in towards the people due to oil prices. Uh, the IMF has urged Angola to end its subsidy program to create room for spending for poverty, such as education, health, the same things that we had to do. And the Kwanzaa has depreciated by 13.5% just this year. OK, um, even though the Kwacha has also done something similar. So the reality is that countries are finding these subsidies unsustainable. Remember, Kenya had to remove subsidies. Nigeria just removed its subsidies. Angola is phasing out its subsidies. So I think everyone needs to understand there is a gradual trend of everybody to understand these subsidy programs are actually harming them, especially with high oil prices and low refinery capacity. So that's part of it. And part of it is also to protect uh, some... Uh, Senongo, which is actually going to be producing uh, refined oil as well. So that's one of them. That's the main story that we're going to lead off with. We've got some other deep dives that we're going to tap into on the other side of the break while we go into um, the main topic of discussion and the charts of the day. But welcome to Behind the Markets, people, the Futuristic Friday edition. And let's get going. We're going to see you on the other side of the break.
Can you hear me? I cannot get you. Okay, can you able to hear me now? Yeah, better. I can hear you now. Okay, so I'm going to tap into some of those numbers I was actually seeing. Angola was actually saying that they spent $3.5 billion on oil subsidies last year. Uh, just on oil subsidies alone, due to the lack of refinery capacity. Uh, now, they are trying to be urged to say, look, you need, and the government has actually agreed to this, that look, we need to start putting money where it impacts the people the most and where it has the most long-term impact. Now, yes, oil subsidies have short-term impact in that they cushion you from an immediate cost. The problem is they don't help in the long term because then government capital is not being allocated correctly. So what they're trying to do is to get more capital or more government spending into fu to funding education. Uh, so this was actually a statement. I'm going to read a quick statement by Minister Nunes in, uh, in, in, uh, in Angola, who actually said the money, will, the money the government saves will be used to fund education, health projects, housing and employment. OK, so these are the things that they're looking at that have a much bigger impact and a broader impact on the income improving opportunities of the people. So remember, but the, the, the thing about Angola is, unfortunately, they've got a huge population that live in poverty. I think it's estimated about 33 percent. I mean, 33 million people are living on much less than anyone can even stomach here. Uh, so that's unfortunately the tough side of what they're going through. But. They, 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 they are trying to say, look, let's try and push as much as we can for people to actually get much better. Now, they're saying to mitigate the risk, the government will also retain gasoline subsidies for taxi drivers, fishermen and farmers. So they're going to try and put targeted subsidies to try and help specific people. Uh, they said the removal of these subsidies will result in important savings, not only for the public, but also for the survival of our state owned uh, oil company, Sonangol. Uh, so that's also what they're trying to do. But really what they're trying to do is reallocate funding to see where they can push growth sectors. Now, this is a conversation that we've been we, we've been fighting as Zambian people. But does it not come back, Vernon, where now we say, look, you see, the, the, the issue here is that these subsidies have not been sustainable, even for oil, uh, oil producing nations, even the oil producing nations like Nigeria and Angola. I don't know what your thoughts are, Vernon. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's uh, primarily, I mean, knowing that we, we don't really produce this commodity, uh, you know, oils and whatnot, uh, really, it's, it's interesting how just, you know, things will still trickle down to where we are as much as we are trying to, uh, people, of course, the public are trying to, you know, have the commodity at the cheapest price possible. I was actually having a conversation yesterday and uh, some of the uh, colleagues were talking about, you know, having fuel to at about nine or seven quadrature. And I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> if well, we can dreams. figure it out all the way down, then are we producing the, the, the same mass of? Are we purifying? Are we refining the same for us to have it at a, a, a price of seven quadrature per liter? And that's just part, you know, ironic. It's good to, to look at things that way, to be optimistic, but, you know, look at also what other elements are on the table. And seeming that's what, of course, uh, I know Africa is facing. And I think we can just put leverage on what we have as well, um, knowing what we can produce and maybe, you know, uh, creating some sort of momentum and leveraging from that and seeing that we can be able to uh, exchange and trade with that. But uh, moving forward, uh, I think we, we should have some sort of, you know, stable scenario because right now with regards to fuel pricings and just the commodity itself in supply. Sorry, Vernon, you've gone, you're getting softer. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we, you, are, you are getting softer, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I actually, I'm actually soft. All right. So I was saying, you know, uh, Africa being just one of the, <laughs> one of the, con I mean, uh, you know, continents where we have so much that we can offer, you know, Nigeria itself has got oil and whatnot. I think if we're going to see how we can, uh, you know, strengthen our trades uh, locally, that should be able to give us even more momentum even to trade uh, with other countries, you know, uh, primarily where we get, you know, oil in other countries and foreign countries apart from, you know, Africa. Uh, but seemingly, of course, these are some of the products that, you know, we have been able to 
produce locally and then we transport elsewhere and then not really making much uh you know uh, value of it if we can for example we can produce a, a drink and then we actually use the same you know value uh, by of course getting more commodities or other commodities that we are unable to produce ourselves from other western or foreign countries that should give us some 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 sort of control over some of these things but primarily uh, some of the things I've noted are that, you know, we are in a position where we are mostly on just receiving ends. Uh, a, a trader, investor or whatever supplier gives us conditions and we, we, don't, we don't really have much to say apart from we're just buying. You know, talk about medicine as well. We are buying all the way out of, you know, Africa we're, and all of that now trickles down. We're just but a buyer. As much as you're a government, you have little to say, you have, you know, uh, little to the, the whole aspect of uh, being able to produce seeing a lot of food and seeing how we can best leverage whatever we can offer on the table and be able to win off you know in a case where you, you have little control over a trade uh really the supplier will have most of the chunk most of control most more most to benefit as compared to you so l let's take a look at even angola because i think there's something interesting there vernon where you said somebody was saying well they wish oil could be at, at 10 kwacha okay let's talk about that uh angola is currently paying uh 51 cents 51 us cents per liter uh which is currently about nine nine kwacha 90 that's the subsidized price so that is still with 50 percent subsidy they had a 75 percent subsidy now they're, they're rolling it down to about a 50 percent subsidy Okay, so that means the market price of Angolan oil, the market price for Angolan oil is about 17 kwacha. Okay, 17 kwacha, 76 in where to be exact. Okay, just, just putting that in, 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 in our thought process. So that's an oil producing nation, which has a market price of 17 kwacha, 76 in where. Let's get that into our minds as Zambians. Okay, let's let's tell our, let's tell ourselves the truth here first. Now, maybe what will happen is when they start refining, they can bring that down. When they when remember that the the Sonango um, factory is actually happening, uh, sorry, refinery is actually set to kick off in 2026. The one that will be able to produce about 200,000 barrels per day. Uh, that's actually going to be quite improved. And there are five refineries, and we as Zambia have in, have invested in one of those to try and see if we can extract some oil cheaper. Now, the issues that still have to happen is remember that America and the rest of the world are investing about $250, $250 million into the Lubito Corridor so that you can go from the Lubito refinery to Kolwezi in, in, in Congo, then from Kolwezi into Solwezi. And that'll be able to get a lot of, uh, a lot of oil in cheaper. Okay, so that might be able to get it cheaper. But remember, this thing has a global market price. Angola is going to be selling it to us at a market price. They're not going to be giving us their subsidized rate, okay? Why should they subsidize us? They're not going to do that, right? So 2026, we will be, yes, trying to get it from Angola, but we'd have to rely on prices coming down and then for being able to get it. We, all, we, all we can do as Zambia, the best we can do is reduce the logistics costs of oil. That's what we can do. Okay, that's why we're investing in a direct pipeline for diesel. That's why we're trying to get a deal with, with, with Angola. That's why we've invested in the Angola refinery so that we can now try and see if we can get a cheaper source and a cheaper logistics. But we are not going to start getting that five kwacha oil you people used to get promised by the past. Listen, that was a fairy tale. Okay, the UAE do not sell cheap oil. They don't do that. They sell expensive oil to the rest of the world. Why? Because they fund their national budget with it. All right. Why would they sell you cheap oil when they know they can sell, when they know they need that to be able to fund their national budget? That's what they do their government running with. They barely tax their citizens so that they use oil money to be able to run their government. That's how they operate. So I think that's what everybody has to understand. They're not going to charge you cheap oil. Plus, on top of that, they are seeing that oil is going to have trouble. Because going into the future, electric cars are rising too fast. The fast growth of electric cars threatens the oil market because 50% of oil goes into cars. Okay, So if most cars produced by 2040 are not going to be running on oil, that is a huge threat to the oil, to the oil producers. And, and this huge investment that's happening in alternative energy, even in electricity, is not going to be generated through oil. So they need to now start looking at diversifying their economy. So what are they going to start doing? Ramping up the price of oil as high as they can. 
to make sure that they can now use that money to diversify their assets and then start to have money gained from other things. These sovereign wealth funds are trying to diversify from gold, I mean from oil, so they are maximizing what they can on the price. So this, the, the OPEC and its, country, and, its, and its members are not going to start reducing the prices. So I think as Zambians, we have to start learning to understand what the global implications of these are and planning our lives and operating accordingly. Okay, so let's try and make sure we operate accordingly. So we have to make sure we plan and we, not, we start using reality, not promises, reality. Okay, plan with reality. The, the people plan with fairy tales. Okay, and then they start saying, ah, oh, I'm disappointed. What were you expecting? This is the problem. The expectations are based on what some honorable who, let's be honest, has questionable education, went and told you in Timbuktu somewhere as some promise. Yeah, we're going to bring it down because he was desperate for your vote. Okay, so let's now bring the t bring things back to reality. And I've been telling you for a long time, Vernon, you can come, you can go through each of the back reels of this show. I've been telling you people what the actual price of oil is for a long time. Okay, if you choose not to listen and choose to listen to what makes you feel nice, tough. There's not much I can do for you. Okay, I've just given you the truth as it is so that you can use it for your planning. But if you choose that you don't want to, it's good. that's your issue. Now, one of the things I do want to say when it comes to oil, we do expect, we, we should be expecting that inflation should actually now also be slowing down. The rate of inflation should continue back on the slowdown path and maybe coming down into the mid nines. The reason I say this is because transport inflation is actually quite important. So there are two components here to inflation. One is the cost of food happening out there in the rest of the world. Most of the cost of the food that we're importing is coming down. Okay, so that's one thing that we should all hold on to. Food imports are coming down in cost, though that's being reversed by the FX rate moving in a negative fashion. So either way, there's a net off effect there. Then we also have diesel prices down. Now, transport costs are two months behind diesel prices. So whatever you're seeing in terms of diesel price reductions will reflect two months later in the transport cost. So we're expecting about a 0.25% deflation in, diesel, in, in transportation costs next month. And another one in the following month, then we'll see what this month. So whatever we're seeing in terms of the shifts downwards in diesel and, and petrol prices, two months later, that will reflect into the transport cost. We're starting to see a two month lag uh, between the transport cost and the diesel announcement and the, and the fuel announcements. So probably in the July and uh, July month in inflation figures, you'll see these impacts of diesel happening now. Uh, you see these impacts of trans in the transportation costs. And the two biggest drivers of inflation have been transport and food. And so both of them are pulling downwards, meaning we should expect the inflation rate to also start pulling downwards. Simultaneously, we're also in the inflation valley, which is the, which is the, the, the cold months of the year. So remember, the cold months of the year also exhibit the lowest inflation generally. So that's what you need to start preparing yourself for. So that's just a bit on the oil market. But... It is just to show you that subsidies are not as easy to manage. Even the oil producing countries are struggling to hold subsidies right now. They, these things are bankrupting them right now. And especially at a time where there's high interest rates, the cost of their debt is getting worse and worse and worse, though it is a political risk that they don't want to try and get rid of. So that's one of the main points. Now let's quickly go into the rest of the deep dive stories. Uh, we are seeing on, the sh on Shanghai, copper rises as China posts surprising factory growth. Uh, factory growth activities unexpectedly swung, gro uh, swung to growth in May from decline. A private sector survey showed that was the CACs and PMI, driven by improved production and demand, helping struggling firms that have been hit by slumping profits. So as you can see, a lot of the metals were up except for nickel and lead. Aluminium was up 1.1%. Zinc was up 0.2%. Uh, tin was up 0.2%. Nickel fell by 0.9%. And lead fell by 0.6%. But you started to see metals were affected by a positive read on the CACs and PMI. And we also saw positive reads in PMIs in Korea and also in Japan. So that also supported the fact that metals prices did start to swing back. However, there is a negative story to this as well. Uh, copper caught in the middle of a West and East manufacturing weak recovery. So on one side, yes, 
China did have a better than expected recovery, but it's still a weak recovery. So recent data has shown that post reopening recovery is running out of steam in China, while manufacturing activity in America, the Eurozone. So you saw the data I was reading for PMIs in the US and the Eurozone is also slowing substantially. So the outlook for the red metal has become severely crimped by fears of a global economic slowdown, which has eroded demand. So 2023 2024, expect copper prices to remain subdued because we'll probably have a surplus. Now, Glencore is trying to also invest in their about $1.4 billion in their Peru mine as well to try and help. But unfortunately, all grades in South America have been a problem. The socialist policies in Chile are also not helping investment. So a lot of these new taxes, these, these higher taxes they're bringing in are holding back investment that's happening and if the government is willing to make that investment good for them so the issues that we all have to start looking at here is that rpr is 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 copper copper for the next two years will be weak but 2025 onwards when we keep seeing ev prices going up remember what we saw with the batteries we saw battery production going up or battery imports from the U.S. going up. So the demand for EVs and batteries, that is all still going up. This is an industry that's still growing about 60 to 100 percent a year. OK, so that's a very important metric because that is where the demand for this copper is going to be now held by. Because usually we, re we rely on copper for infrastructure and housing. That is where copper generally goes in construction work in infrastructure and housing. Now there is a competing interest of, re of renewable energy such as uh, solar wiring. And also there's also a competing interest of copper for uh, copper for, for, for what's it for electric cars. So if we keep seeing electric cars rising, that gives that resilience. And we think I think what we're going to see in 2025 to 2030 is we're going to see EV demand now become the lead customer of copper. And also remember, smelter smelter capacities in Asia are going to grow huge amounts, 2.4 million, 1 million, and just half a million in, in China, India, and Indonesia combined. So copper smelting is also going to go up. So therefore, the demand for copper also starts to go up as well. So the, the, the creation of smelters does actually help improve copper demand. So that is what's going to push the price upwards. And that's why we're expecting 2025, especially 2026 onwards, 11,000 to $15,000 on the copper price. That's why you need, that's why everyone's trying to position themselves in the CEC, ZCCM and African explosive. Now, while things are cool, so that when things go forward, when, when the price now kicks in, I'm going to bet on the price kicking in due to the growth of the EV sector. So we're using data here, people, to come up with these conclusions, not from the air. We're not plucking conclusions from the air. We're seeing the growth of the EV sector, the impact it's had on the price. We've seen the price resiliently hold above 8,000. Okay, that it's whenever 7,000 hits, that becomes a support and it's up. We had a problem before when there was no EV demand, where copper demand, where copper prices hit as low as 5,500 in the middle of that period where China was really in a slowdown. So a Chinese slowdown has not reacted in copper prices dropping to the 5,500 we got accustomed to. We are still seeing copper prices above 8,000. Why is that? Because we have an electric car market that's actually helping that out. So that's just some thoughts that we can pick up on. Um, so yeah, uh, as before, we, uh, well, I was going to ask, but anyway, let's go into the other story that also picked up yesterday. We did see that OPEC has been stated that they're unlikely to deepen oil supply cuts in their June 4 meetings, despite a fall in oil prices heading towards 70. Uh, as the economic outlook has worsened, OPEC Plus members did pledge to, to in April to, to increase voluntary cuts from May. Uh, total output... Total output cuts already are about 3.6 million barrels per day, which is 4% of global consumption. The group has already cut more than its target, especially because of limitations in capacity in West Africa producers such as Nigeria and also Angola. Okay, sorry, West African producer Nigeria and also Angola, who are having refinery, who are having production problems right now. However, the Russian deputy minister did say that he does not expect any new steps from OPEC in their Vienna meeting because he said, look, even countries such as even countries like Iraq are currently having much lower production levels. So he's saying the low production levels are going to mitigate for the cuts. Now, the countries in OPEC plus who really determine what's going to happen are Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Russia. These are the three countries that determine. OK, so that, that's what everyone has to understand. Yes, there may be a vote, but these are the three determining countries. Russia is profitable with $40 oil. Okay, As long as oil is above $40, 
Russia is profitable. Uh, the UAE, uh, so the Arab, uh, the Arabic nations are very profitable. That's why Saudi Aramco is knocking out record profits. The moment oil is between fifty and sixty dollars, so oil fifty and sixty dollars. So already he had seventy going on to eighty. They have a very, very profitable oil sector. Very profitable. They were talking about billions of dollars sitting in profits in their Saudi Aramco company, which can they can now pump into their government budgets. So for them, this is a win. Okay, this is an actual win for them. So as it stands, so they're okay with the price as it is. So Russia is okay. China, uh, Russia is okay, and Saudi Arabia are okay at this price. Now they don't want it to fall too low, probably below sixty-five. They will start to resist that with huge price cuts. But somewhere around seventy to seventy-five, they're fine. They're very profitable, and things are very strong for them. So I think they're okay with that. So that's why it's also unlikely seeing the production problems that are building up with some of the other countries. So it's unlikely that they'll actually they'll actually deepen the cuts. But the big story for today, Vernon, which is for the travel industry, is travel demand has continued to be strong in April. Domestic travel has actually fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. This is actually an interesting thing, and it's also good for our travel sector and our tourism sector. So those of you who are tourism agents, Please keep an eye on what's happening in terms of the global skies. It appears people are traveling heavily. Uh, travel, total traffic in April 2023 rose 45% compared to April 2022. And now it's at 90% of pre-COVID levels. Domestic travel uh, was up 42.6% compared to a year ago and has fully recovered, posting a 2.9% increase from April 2019. So we've even got more domestic travel than we had in 2019. International travel climbed 48% and is 80 uh, and is 83% of April 2019 levels. So we don't have much, but the leading group of people who are traveling around the world are Asian Pacific countries. The Asian Pacific Airlines are leading. Interestingly, Vernon, African Airlines traffic rose by 53.5%, the second highest amongst the region. So there's actually a lot of movement in African airlines at the moment. So that's been one of the, they've been the second highest growth story. So when you look at some of our data coming out of here in our chart of the day, we actually are looking at this air passenger travel and you can see that the biggest, the biggest movement was in Asian, uh, Asian countries, 170% uh, in terms of revenue, revenue traveling, uh, sorry, revenue passenger kilometers, 170% increase in there, 47.1% for Africans, Latin America, 15%, Middle East, 36.8%, uh, North America, 13.9%, and Europe, 22%. This is data from IATA, uh, the, the, the main authority on airline travel. So this is actually IATA's latest report. This article actually came from IATA. And you can see now in terms of uh, year-on-year uh, airline traffic growth uh, for the month of April, 193% growth by Asian. What have these people been doing? <laughs> like, this is a huge amount of growth. 193%. This almost triple the amount. Are, are these guys working or have they just decided they're on vacation now? <laughs> So they're literally flying all over the place. By the way, China has also launched its airline. So I think that's maybe what you have to remember. China has launched its airlines with plan of having 8,000 planes in the air by 2050. They've got a long vision here. And they're, they're challenging the main two. So that's also what's, what's also increasing it. But 193% increase in Asia Pacific travel. Africa is next with 54%. Uh, Middle East with 38%. North America, 35%. Latin America, 26%. And Europe down at the bottom with 23%. So the, I think for me, one of the best stories for us here in Zambia is this chart that shows that African travel is up 54% uh, from last year. That's actually good data because then that means that as African uh, African travel, it means that also tourism opportunities for Zambia, hotels, lodging, all these things we should be seeing. So those of you who've got Airbnbs, those of you who have got lodging, those of you who got hotels. Now we've only got one hotel stock on the stock exchange, and that is I think Pomozi Hotel. Um, that stock doesn't move much, but you know it does does still have it is a company uh, that should be experiencing more travel and more inflow. Remember the amount of conferences we're holding, so this should be a good signal for the airline travel statistics we should be hearing from Zambia Airports Authority for quarter two. This should tell us that quarter two data should actually be quite strong. And this what's happening around the world is what we call revenge travel. Now this is also pushing up the demand 
for um, fuel, for airline fuel, so for, for jet fuel. It's actually increasing the demand for jet fuel. So you might find that Puma Energy might benefit as well as the stock. Uh, so keep an eye out for Puma Energy jet fuel sales because that might signal what's happening here as well. So this is just some of the information that we just wanted to put out there. This is year-to-year -year growth in airline travel traffic. And this is the table that we had in terms of passenger, passenger kilometers traveled. Asians are literally in the air perpetually, while Africa is also seeing a lot of movement in terms of Africa airlines. What are your thoughts, Vernon, in terms of what that might do for tourism? Think, you know, for, for starters, the tourism industry has uh, had uh, a very interesting run with regards to just, you know, being able to generate its own particular income um, uh, due to the old COVID-19. Though the COVID-19, it's been, uh, you know, a while since it's been gone. So I think also does some innovation around this well, sector. Well, well, well officially, it only went last month. Officially. But officially. in Africa... We, 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 we chose to just say, ah, this thing is done. But officially, it, it, it's, it's no longer a global pandemic as of last month. I think that was, that's just officially. That's just but officially, yo. Yeah, so we, we, we know movements and people actually have been able to move about and whatnot, even, you know, before the official announcements and pronunciations and whatnot. But, you know, in this particular sector, I think um, Zambia in particular has a lot to do with regards to tourism and just enhancing uh, you know, activities around the sector. And for Africa at large, uh, you know, seeing that, you know, there's all of this, you know, um, opening of airlines. I think recently also we saw our local, uh, you know, uh, airlines as well doing the most. We also saw Zambia as well pulling in a very interesting plane as well in just regards to, uh, you know, extending and enhancing the same, which is very good uh, for the economy as well as just, you know, building on the capacity and revenue generation in that regard. But, you know, primarily, um, tourism industry i feel it is not really and you know unlocked to its very full potential for i think africa is equally one of the most beautiful continents around the world and we have quite a lot to offer and this is why every now and then even when there's you know a few of us locals you know visiting and you know enjoying the local resources uh, and you know just uh, you know uh, the beauty of africa foreigners will always visit you because they know what of course africa is is just you know endowed with and you know uh we can pretty much leverage on that i was just speaking to lucky just earlier about you know sports that you know they're actually reducing ticket prices to what about 20 quarter and 25 quarter you know just so they can encourage people to watch soccer imagine how packed it is whenever you you know it's a premier league game going on whenever there's chelsea or whoever playing people are packed in these you know places watching but why don't do why don't they do the same with when Inkana or whoever is, is doing that so they're also trying to promote in that regard i don't know what steps can be taken regarding just you know making these things even more accessible to the locals um i also noticed that you know with regards to, to the plane tickets and whatnot there actually has been a very interesting fee attached to the economy vip and whatnot just so that people can access it more uh, you know easily and you know fees to be a bit more flexible for almost everyone to be able to afford you know as cheap as possible so i think uh, as much as you want to lower costs uh, you know um you know pay i mean fees and whatnot so people can be able to access these things i think we ourselves need to really just look at this and be able to encourage as well you know these sectors as much as we're calling on you know them to enhance make it more accessible make it more beautiful and whatnot and more convenient i think we should also as well support them in every way possible you know if you go on social media people will show you photos of foreign countries uh, on their statuses and whatnot but they will not the very few us to take photos of you know our local places throw them around if you go home to Ali, for example on um Church Road, for example, you go there at about maybe 7 p.m. or at about 8 p.m. Stand from somewhere, um, I would say maybe um, you know just a a along the road, just before you know Central Police. You have a you have a broad look. It looks beautiful. One who's not been on that road will not think it's in Lusaka. It's just beautiful like that. So you don't even have to go to Livingston for you to know that Zambia actually has beautiful places for you to reach and enjoy them. You know, so I think we should also look at that, you know, take a different approach to our own selves. You have people coming all the way from outside Lusaka coming to enjoy Lusaka because, because it's beautiful. And we have locals from Lusaka going all the way in these other, other parts of the country. Zambia has it. Africa has it to start with. You know, I was video video chatting with a lady from uh, Namibia the other day in Windhoek. It is 
it, it looks like it's not in Africa. It's that I'm nice. I'm going to ask you what this chat was about one day. Oh. Brother, <laughs> you, you know, you, you gave us too much details in that. In that, why didn't you just say a person? Why why, why did you have to? No, now we are going to ask about the details of this comment. But continue. Well, she has visited was it, before. Was it the scenery that looked beautiful, or was it the person? <laughs> Were you oh. describing the person? <laughs> I think on the other side them. of this <laughs> <laughs> yeah but really africa has so much to offer and i think we need to do more beautify it package it well in every way possible so we can set it out you know i'll, I'll say one thing to people we always talk about trade with africa do you notice that before you can trade you need to travel okay you know one of the things i'll tell as many people as possible as much as I, I will tell you to manage your finances well and make sure you, and I'm and I'm not joking about this part, people manage your finances well, please. That's the one thing this country needs. But travel is an investment. I want you to think about it this way. Why? Because it does something to your mind. People who travel, you know, I, I looked at um, this. The, the the remember they used to have these startup grind talks in Zambia where we talked to all these entrepreneurs. One other thing I found was about 74% of them had been had actually lived outside of Zambia for at least three or more years. Okay, that's a big thing, by the way. That's a huge exposure point that the people who actually engage in entrepreneurship have had their minds opened a lot. So one of the things we should actually be investing in in this country is just seeing other places, even if it means seeing other places in Africa. By the way, these people are not in England. Some of them were. But they were here in Africa and just in other countries, just being exposed to other people. You know, I have a, I have a, I have a, I've got what I call the, the I'm, I'm coming up with my 10 countries with, with beaches that I want to go to. Um, and I've actually like written them down and I'm actually trying to go to at least one, one of them every two years for the rest of my life. Angola, Mozambique, Tanzania, Namibia, Ghana, Egypt, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria. Niger now, Malawi, I'm just targeting the lake there, uh, but I'm still looking for the 10th one here. But the point I'm trying to say is, and I'm thinking about Mauritius or Madagascar, but the point I'm trying to say is you want to try and go to as many places as you can uh, within this continent. If we're going to trade with each other, we need to travel to each other. Now, I'm also picked these countries, Vernon, because I have friends in these countries. So it's actually easy for me to connect with somebody there and say, hey, can I come to your country? I'm, I'm pitching up there just for a bit of a vacation. If you've got friends in other countries, try and reach out to them. You're on social media. There are people there. Maybe you've got family in other in these other places. It's not about always going to these other these these other continents. It's also about trying to see each other. It's actually quite important to have Africa to Africa travel if we're going to encourage trade. So the first thing you want to do before you get people to trade with each other is they must culturally exchange with each other. And that comes through trade. That comes through our musicians making music with each other, uh, seeing a Zambian artist working with a Tanzanian artist. That also encourages curiosity about each other. Things that encourage curiosity about each other are the things that will encourage trade with one another. So I actually think this is very important for us to try and help this. Now, the only problem is now trying to get direct flights between African countries. Now, we're starting to see this working, at least Mozambique, Zambia. We're starting to see some of it is starting to get fixed. But our, our, our airline, our, our association of airlines and, and our network here is pretty entangled. So it's pretty messed up here. So people have to travel to some central hubs in order for them to be able to go certain places. So direct flights towards other countries and then organization of airspace is another issue. So it's, it, there's a lot of complications that have made it very difficult for Africans to visit each other. Okay, that's why people just bus. And then when people think about that bus trick just to go somewhere, that's harsh. Then there's also places you want to try and see even here domestically so that we can kind of have that, that drive through. However, the tourism operators have openly said they prefer the Europeans because the Europeans stay for 21 days. Africans, they stay for two days. However, there is a way to still balance all of this. Okay, so let's see what we can try to do. Obviously, visa issues are other issues as well. But I think for me, my, my goal is I, I've, I've told myself I want to see the top 10 beaches in Africa uh, because they are beautiful. I've actually sold myself. I actually want to see them. Uh, TripAdvisor has actually given us the, the top beaches of Africa. So let's take a look at what they've actually said on TripAdvisor for the top beaches in Africa. And I'm going to read the top 10 Ngui so I've already read that horribly. Nungui Beach in Zanzibar, that's number one. 
uh, Santa Monica, uh, Santa Monica Beach in Cape Verde uh, is number two. Uh, Pri is it? Wow, these names. These are Spanish names now. Pri Pr Pra de Santa Maria is number three in Cape Verde as well. They're really marketing Cape Verde here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, number four, uh, sorry, number five is Montechoisi Beach in Mauritius. Uh, Anselaizo Beach in Seychelles. You know, this is all these tiny islands. <laughs> these these tiny islands that are off as well. Uh, Diana Be Diani Beach in, in Kenya. Uh, Paje Beach in, uh, in Zanzibar again. So these are some of the areas that they are actually pointing out there. These are places where they've actually talked about this. But these are areas we should actually be talking about. But anyway, let's get into uh, our topic of discussion, Vernon, as we try and wind up today, which is now the other side of Munyumba's conversation where he talks to you about making sure you handle your money correctly. So people ask me questions, Vernon, about saving. They'll say, Munyumba, I want to retire in five years. I want to retire in five years, and I want to be able to have a nice life. And I ask them, okay, so how much do you make? Well, they'll give me an example. Well, you I make about uh, 20 grand. Okay. Uh, how much are you comfortable living off? Well, I'd like to live off at least 15 and then I'll be comfortable. So this tells you, okay, if you are say what, how many years out that is this table on the left column there, it shows you how many years you're investing for. Assuming you're investing for 7.5% above inflation, which is your bond rate, which is about 8% 8, 8 above inflation, 9%. Uh, the average annual compound growth rate of your salary should be 3.5% uh, above inflation. This has been based on NAPSA data. We've actually managed to track that as well. Your target you're trying to get is 75%. You miss no investment months, and you're starting from a zero wealth balance. So what are you looking to save and invest? Well, if you only do it for five years and you're saving 10% of your income, you'll only be able to replace 3% of your income. So this is what happens when you do things for a short period of time. If you do it for 10 years, that's 7%. If you do it for 15 years, 12%, 20 years, 18%, uh, 25 years, 25%, 30 years, 33%, 35%, 43%. So saving 10% of your income if you're trying to retire is not a good idea. Okay, does everyone understand this? It is not a good idea. Okay, it just it just is not people. It's just not. Uh, now, if you look at uh, the savings rate, if you now push your savings rate to fifteen, after five years, you'll only be able to to to. Or in fact, let's look at after five years. If you're saving ten percent, you'll only be able to replace three percent of your income. You're projected. Uh, if you save fifteen percent, it's five percent. If you save twenty percent, it's six percent. If you save twenty-five percent, it's eight percent. If you save thirty percent, it's only ten percent. If you save thirty-five percent, it's eleven percent. So a five-year retirement goal, and you haven't started saving and investing at all, is a bad plan. Okay. So let me just tell you, people, outright, it's a bad plan. Okay. So let's look at a ten-year retirement goal. You want to retire in 10 years if you're saving seven to uh, ten percent then you only have seven percent of your income eleven percent of your income if you're saving fifteen percent twenty percent of your income if you're saving fourteen percent twenty uh, eighteen percent of your income if you're saving twenty five percent and if you go all the way to thirty five is twenty five percent of your income let's take a look now at fifteen year retirement retirement goal you might want to retire in fifteen years okay so that means that if you're saving only ten percent well then you better be prepared to only live off twelve percent of what you're making now okay that's what you should be prepared for um, or if you're trying to save 20%, then you can get a quarter. You, you're, you're likely to probably have a quarter. Uh, if you get to 30%, you're likely to only have 36%. Now, if you try and save for 20 years, now look at how this starts to improve. After 20 years, if you're doing 20 years of investing, if you're doing 10%, it's only 18% income replacement that's likely. 20%, it's only 35% income replaced that's likely. 30% savings and investment rate, we're looking at 53% of income that's likely. Now, let's take a look at maybe pushing this, this, this retirement plan out to 25 years. It's kind of the sweet spot for everybody. If you're looking at 25 years, you'll notice the sweet spot is 25 years, 30% of your income. Okay? 30% of your income for 25 years, uh, sorry, for, yeah, for 25 years gets you 75% of your income. So if you're looking at saying, you might like to retire of 15%, I will tell you 25 years, 30% of your income, that's your sweet spot that you should be targeting. Now, let's take a look at some other data that should help you. How much, uh, if this is also a table that should help you take a snapshot of, take a screenshot. But this number tells you what, uh, if you were to look at the ratio 
of your income and your assets, your financial assets versus your annual income. So your monthly income times 12. So you take all your financial assets, your stocks, your bonds, your unit trusts, and your retirement account at work, divide it by the total number of um, the total number of this that you're getting, the, 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 your, your total annual income. The number here that we should be looking at should be this. So if you want to retire in five years and you're saving 10%, well, then your total asset wealth should be eight times your annual income. Okay. So if you're making 20,000, right, then you should be telling me, Munyumba, I've got eight times 240,000, meaning Munyumba, I've got, I've got 2 million kwacha in assets. Then I can tell you to save 10% for the next couple of years, and then you can retire in five years. Okay. But if you don't have 2 million kwacha in assets, perhaps maybe you need to rethink your strategy and the timelines you're thinking of. Okay. So this is, this is what we call a reality check. Whenever I have to give people a reality check, when they look into their future of what they're looking at. So these are the numbers, capture them very quickly. They kind of speak to you very well. But this is the most important one, Vernon. Most people tell me, Munyumba, I want to retire in 10 years. Okay. And, and I ask them, okay, what do you have? I've got nothing. Okay, cool. So let's talk about this. How much of your income do you want? If you want 75% of the income you're making, you if you want to do that, it is recommended. These are the recommended savings rate. Are you willing to save 71% of your income and only live off 29% of what you make? If the answer is no, then push out your retirement plan. If the answer is yes, then we're in the money here. Okay, because this is what Grant Cardone had to do to even become a millionaire in 10 years. He had to save 66% of his net income, okay, and live off only a third. That's what he had actually trained himself to do. So even you, you must learn to live off a third of what you make and then invest, or in fact, 29% of what you make for you to be able to invest in you. So that's just a number I'll throw out to you. Finally, Vernon. I'll give you all my final thought of the day. This is a reality check, people. Take these numbers down. They'll help you. Uh, this is basically the budget that I had wanted to give people as well. If you're an aggressive young investor, the domination here is Dave Ramsey teaches you to use a zero budget. Cardone teaches you the 40% rule. If you want to try and do this, if you really want to venture into it, this is the math that you have to try and adhere to. Living uh, your income, whatever you make, 11% is for the things you want. 22% is for the things you need. 66% is for your assets. That's the way you live, okay? That's what we call a beans and carpenter, <laughs> a beans and carpenter budget. <laughs> For, this is a beans and carpenter budget, people. <laughs> no fast food, nothing. <laughs> and that's the reality you will have to accept. Um, check these numbers out, people. I'll post them up for you later for you to try and take a look at. But these are the numbers you should be paying attention to. Vernon, before we wind up today, uh, any thoughts before we go? Yeah. Um, so when uh, if, if if you cut out on the fast food, <laughs> uh, and you're using the bus, the bus, <laughs> fast foods, bus, no new clothes, nothing. Uh, it's, this is one of the things that we seemingly just, but you know, throw under the bus and pretend as though you don't want to see them. But if you calculate how much one is getting paid at the end of the month, things that actually do chop up one's you know salary are those same. Fast foods, bars, you know, wanting to look nice, fancy accessories, jewelry, uh, Friday. having a nice morning and whatnot. But really, Friday. just just narrow down. It does about thirty or to a minute. Why it's essential to leave and pause and see that it's essential to live within your means, is because that gives you enough margin to invest. When you live below your income, that money that's living below your income, you can now allocate to investment. And every investment you make is a, is a point to your freedom. If you want to be free, then you have to actually do actions towards that freedom. Otherwise, you're pegged to your work. You'll say you don't like your work, all this stuff. But if you don't like your work, how much money are you putting to your freedom? You can't tell me you don't like your job and then you're putting nothing to your freedom. That, it, it makes no sense. So if you want to be free, you have to hold assets, assets that can generate cash flow, not assets where the money just gets stuck. It's just piling up things. You need assets that can make money. An asset has to put cash in your pocket. Okay. So pile up income generating cash flow assets. 
That is the way you try and do it. And you have to do that. You have to live way below your means. So the, the more aggressively you live below your means, it's more telling me how much you want, you, want, you, you want your freedom. You can tell me you want your freedom, but if I'm not seeing aggressive living within your means, you don't want it. You're desiring it, but you don't want it. Thank you so much, Mtrole. Uh, that should have been very insightful for our listeners and, of course, viewers for the day. Cheers. Have a good day.